the inspector was right. Whatever we were following had left the whole mess in its wake, which at least left us a clear path to follow. Trees had been torn from their roots and blasted backward off the trail. Some of the trunks were still smoking. The dirt had a radioactive tint of green, and the leaves under our feet grew crisper and blacker with every step. There was even a hint of ozone in the air. I had felt that same crackle at the abandoned radio station a few cases ago, and my fingers tightened around my pistol at the memory. Janine stayed ahead of us, but never disappeared totally from view. I could always see her shadow climbing over rocks and brushing aside half-visible branches. The fog was getting even worse. The inspector, in all of his grayness, seemed to melt into it. I couldn't tell if his cigar had stopped smoking for once, or if the mist was so dense that I couldn't tell the difference. Guys? Janine called back to us. She had stopped several feet away and was staring at something I couldn't see from this distance. I clambered forward and peered into the fog. At first, I wasn't sure what I was looking at. Then a twinkle of red flashed in front of me. Yeah, I took a startled step back. The air shimmered like waves rippling outward on a body of water. As I continued to stare, I made out vague shapes in the ripples. A single gnarled tree, a pool of brackish water. This in red maces on a flat horizon. It's a rip, the inspector said. A doorway to another dimension. The entity's been here, which means... Janine, no! Without warning, she had run forward and plunged head-on into the shimmering wall of air. There was an enormous sucking sound like water slurping down a drain, and then... Janine's figure was running through that otherworldly red desert. She made a beeline for the grimy oasis, and suddenly I saw why. There was a body slumped under the ground by the water. Marconi, I whispered. I started to follow her, but the inspector grabbed my arm. Stop, he hissed. You have no idea what's behind that rip. The air could be toxic, the sun could burn you alive. There could be worse monsters than a wendigo slumbering there, waiting for prey to wander by. Doesn't matter, I said. If there's even a chance Marconi's alive in there, I have to take it. You get that, don't you? The inspector looked dubious, but after a few tense seconds, he let go of my arm. I didn't wait for him to follow. I raised my gun and hurried after Janine, leaping into the world beyond the rip. For a second, the mist was replaced by a brain-spattering white void. And I felt like my body was being stretched like a piece of human taffy. Then the world snapped back into place and I was running across a sea of gritty red sand. A surprising chill tickled down the skin of my neck. Despite the enormous sun that hovered precariously in the orange sky, the air seemed breathable. At least. But there was a distinct aftertaste of copper on my tongue that I didn't like one bit. Janine had stopped running and was now staring down at the slumped body on the sand. Fearing the worst, I approached her, but it wasn't Marconi. The corpse in question was a teenage boy wearing tattered khakis and a large beige backpack. His eyes bulged out of his head like peeled grapes, and his hair had turned entirely white. Sinewy green vines sprouted from his skin and dug into the ground like a tangle of thick wires. As I approached, the vines pulsed, sending bulbs of faint green light from the body into the sand below. I guess we found one of the missing campers, I muttered, covering my mouth and nose. Coppery stench was ten times worse over here. The inspector approached from behind me and knelt down over the camper's corpse. His fingers traced the pulsing vines, his brow furrowed. The smoke from his cigar was a thin, weak shade of gray. Fear, he said. This particular entity likes to feed on fear. I suppose our poor friend here was uh, afraid of starvation, or isolation, or maybe just wide open spaces. In any case, he's been bled dry. There's nothing we can do for him now. I looked up from the body, feeling mildly sick, staring off at the horizon. There was something funny about it. I took a few steps past the oasis and I realized there was no horizon. The ground literally ended after a few hundred feet or so. The mesas weren't distant, they were incredibly small. I turned in circles. For a second I forgot about the dead body. The oasis was smack dab in the center of this desert, and the desert itself was barely more than an island floating impossibly in that orange sky. If I walked for a minute in any direction, I'd reach the end of the world. Inspector? I said. What is this place? The inspector straightened up and looked off to the fake horizon. 
His skin looked sicklier than usual under the light of the massive sun. Hmm. I've heard the empathic giants could create pocket universes, places to store their food, but I've never actually seen one before. Supposedly, they slow the flow of time to keep the victim alive longer, giving the entities a food source for years at a time, centuries even. I looked back at the rippling air that led to the misty forest. Through the rip, I could see leaves swirling in a sluggish tornado on the ground inching along like footage from a stop-motion film. Olivia's not here, Janine said. She left the camper's body and strode past the gnarled tree. There was another rip not too far away. I noticed this one spilling over with a green light, the color of unripened fruit. Janine approached the tear, set down her backpack, and pulled out a flare from her stockpile. She lit the fuse with a battered lighter and let the flare fall to the sand. Bright red lights spattered from the tube and cast shadows along the ground. Breadcrumbs, she said. If time is slow here, this will last a while. All we have to do is follow it home again. Then she shouldered her backpack and stepped into the rift. There was a similar slurping sound and she was gone. I looked at the inspector. He wasn't smiling, but... I could see the faintest glint of admiration in his eyes. Come. Before the flare burns down, we have to follow her. Together, we hurried forward. My body stretched like the world's longest elastic. And then, the world snapped back into place. This time, we were standing in a sparsely furnished room. Its roof opened to a roiling green sky. The wood in the walls stretched up until the planks came loose and floated disjointed into the void. Janine was already examining the next body. This one was a young woman, in jeans and a denim vest. Her hair a gleaming white and her dead fingers clutching a shattered flashlight. The same pulsing vines draped over her corpse and vanished into the woodwork. Damn it, I muttered. We're too late. There was no point in pouring over the poor girl's body, and besides, Janine had already moved on. There were no doors out of this room, but another rip floated in the air just by the far wall. This one emitted a purple glow, the color of decaying violets. Janine lit another flare, dropped it on the floorboards, and stepped into the portal. The inspector and I were right on our heels. And so it went. Rip after rip, world after world, we trekked through increasingly bizarre pocket dimensions. One looked like the skeleton of some vast creature with three spines and a jawbone the size of a small house. The portal was buried at the base of its tail. Another was turned completely upside down, so that we had to find our footing on a narrow strip of land or fall up into a starless void. Everywhere we went, found more bodies. None of which were Marconi's, thank God, but it still made my stomach turn to see these poor dead campers with their pale skin and bulging eyes. At every stop, without fail, Janine lit another flare to mark our progress. I wondered if she'd ever run out of those things. At one point, I looked back and I saw a dizzying tunnel of flares, a string of light flashing in scattered, slow-moving patterns. Let's hope they wouldn't go out before we found Marconi. There was no sign of the Wendigo, or the giant, or whatever the hell we were chasing here, and for a while, I thought that we might make it to the end of this cosmic maze without running into the damn thing at all. But then the last portal dumped us into a huge cave covered with glowing specks of lichen. And there it was. A hulking humanoid shape slumped in the corner, so quiet, so still, it might have been a statue. I knew it was a Wendigo. Crackle of ozone in the air was so strong I could feel my nose starting to bleed. Olivia! Janine hissed. And there she was. Marconi was propped up against the wall of the cave, still wearing her sheriff's uniforms, vines slithering from her exposed arm into the rock. From this distance, I couldn't tell if she was breathing. The images of the camper's corpses wouldn't leave my head, and when Janine broke into a run, I was only a few steps behind her. Our footsteps were muffled by the blanket of lichen on the cave floor, but I had no idea if the Wendigo was asleep or resting or just faking it. And I wasn't going to make a ruckus in order to find out. At one point, Janine and I had to stop due to a deep chasm that opened up suddenly in front of us, leaving us only a narrow footbridge. The bottom of the pit was too far down to make out, but I could see the glint of sharp stalagmites jutting out of the darkness. 
the two of us crossed the bridge as quickly as we dared, the inspector gliding along behind us on his usual silent footsteps. Once we were safely on the other side, Janine rushed to Marconi and cupped the sheriff's cheeks in her hands. There were definitely strands of gray in her hair, but her eyes... Her eyes were closed, and the rise and fall of her chest was unmistakable. Marconi was alive. I almost sank to my knees in the lichen. I was so relieved, but Janine was tugging on Marconi's shoulders now, and the sheriff refused to budge. The vines were wrapped so tightly around her she was bound to the cave wall. Every few seconds, pulses of bright green light traveled down the vines, sliding from her arm into the wall of stone. Janine tried yanking at the vines, but they were embedded deep in Marconi's skin. The pulses grew brighter, as if sensing Janine's resistance, and Marconi shifted slightly inside her tangled prison. The inspector appeared suddenly by my side. I don't mean to rush you, he said, his voice low and oddly calm. But we have a company. I whirled around. The hulking shape in the corner had risen from its crouched position, and now I have a behemoth of shadow blocking out the light from the glowing lichen. Before, I thought of it as a humanoid, but there was something wrong about it. Something about the curve of its limbs and the blocky, misshapen head slumped on its broad shoulders. It was too dark to make out its facial features, if it had any at all. I couldn't tell if it had skin or scales or fur or feathers. It was just darkness. Darkness made solid and I could only stand and stare as the beast took a rumbling step towards us. I lifted my gun for all the good that it would do. But the inspector moved before I could. One second, a man was standing in front of me. The next, well, hard to say. Outwardly, the inspector looked the same, but I had the strange sense that he'd grown to enormous proportions, like a giant squeezed into a tiny body. It reminded me of that night that he'd shown me his true form on the highway. A figure I knew... It was just a vessel, a puppet, its strings being yanked by something large and invisible. Looking at him made my head throb. The inspector reared back and punched the shadowy beast. His fist struck like a meteor, leaving a fiery imprint on the creature's hide, causing it to bellow and stumble back. The floor of the cave trembled with each step. For a half a second, I hoped that it would fall backwards into the chasm, but the Wendigo only took a second or two to regain its footing. It lumbered forward and battered at the inspector with a clawed, misshapen hand. I fired a single shot at the oncoming limb, but the bullet sank into its hide with the sound of a muffled thwomp. Then the inspector was flying across the cave. His whole body went limp as if the invisible puppeteer had left it, and when he struck the far wall, he slumped into a curled position on the ground. The cigar dropped from his lips and rolled away. Its tip smoldered for a second or two, then went out. No! I shouted, feeling something snap inside me. I fired another three shots at the Wendigo, but the bullets only seemed to irritate it. It turned its monstrous head to look at me, and I saw a bulbous globe of eyeballs staring out of its skull, each one bloodshot and vaguely human. It took a threatening step forward. A tremor swept across the ground and knocked me off my feet, whacking my hand against the stone and causing the gun to skitter out of my grip into the darkness. I didn't bother looking for it. What was the point? The thing had already proven itself immune to bullets, and if the inspector didn't leave a dent in the thing, then what fucking chance did I have? I looked at Janine as if to apologize, but she wasn't staring at me or even the Wendigo. She had managed to pry a few of the vines off Marconi's face and was kissing her on the lips, tears streaming down her cheeks. Another step, another tremor. Rocks came loose from the walls and tumbled around our feet. If one of those came down on our heads, we'd be done for, Wendigo or not. The creature was leaning down now, blinking its mismatched eyes. I scrambled back against the wall, but there was no time to stand, no time to run. Just a cower. The Wendigo swung its massive hand downward, and the air swooshed as it did so. I found myself thinking suddenly of Ruth's face. Ruth and the kids. And I closed my eyes. So I could see them one last time. And then... The Wendigo faltered. I opened my eyes. Its hand had faltered hovering just a few feet above our heads. For a second I thought, absurdly, that my memory of Ruth had somehow stopped the creature in its tracks. Then I saw that Marconi was standing. And even though a web of vine still trailed from her skin into the wall, her eyes were aware and clear. And she was pissed. Hey, shit for brains! She yelled. Why don't you back the fuck up? 
The vines pulsed, but instead of the usual green, a hot red light traveled down Marconi's arms and into the stone. The wendigo yowled like a wounded mountain lion and lifted its hands to its ears, as if Marconi's voice had ruptured whatever passed for eardrums. Marconi took a step forward, and the vines moved with her, snaking across the ground. You don't scare me, she shouted. You fucking Bigfoot wannabe. The wendigo made a series of dissonant yaps and staggered backwards. The cave trembled again, and I leaped aside as a boulder the size of our minivan came crashing down where I'd been standing. Marconi and Janine didn't seem bothered by the potential cave-in. They stood there, framed in the light of the lichen. Two small figures in all that trembling vastness. And one more thing, Marconi said. She lowered her voice, but still carried the cave as if she'd spoken it through a megaphone. Stay the fuck away from my friends. The Wendigo took another step back, but its foot slipped on the lip of the chasm, and suddenly... It was plummeting like a felled sequoia. The enormous dark shape slipped out of view. I was afraid to move. What if it came crawling out of the pit? More pissed off than ever. And then something black and gooey spurted upwards. Followed by the loudest and most agonizing howl of pain I'd ever heard. The walls gave out one final tremble. Then the cave fell silent. Janine let out a choked laugh and flung her arms around Marconi. The vines from her slipped from her skin like desiccated IV tubes, shriveling into nothing on the cave floor. Marconi wrapped Janine in a tight squeeze and spun her into a circle, her hiking boots barely brushing the ground. Ah, damn, I breathed. How the hell did you do that, Marconi? The sheriff noticed me for the first time. Her hair was streaked with gray and her cheeks were gaunter than I remembered, but the smirk on her face was 100% Marconi. I hadn't realized how damn much I'd missed her. That smirk. Should have known you'd be involved in this shit, Hannigan, she said. And you, of course you're here. I turned to see the inspector approaching us, and relief flooded through me so strong that I felt a little dizzy. His body didn't seem to have taken on much of a beating, but his trench coat was torn and dirty, and his fedora had been knocked askew. The cigar was back in his mouth, but it was still thin, though. Barely more than a cigarette. I didn't smoke at all. The tip simply glowed a low orange. Ah, you son of a bitch. I thought you were done for. The inspector's smile was faint. Yes, well, I've been through worse. But I'm afraid you won't have time to stand around celebrating. Now that the giant is dead, this universe and all the ones it's created will come undone. We have to go. I peered through the gloom, trying to make out the flash of Janine's flares amidst all the lichen. And there it was bright orange sparks spinning in slow motion. We had to cross the footbridge to reach it. Even as the thought crossed my mind, a rock fell from the ceiling and smashed through one of the wooden planks. That familiar trembling picked up again, and this time I was afraid there was no stopping it. A loud keening sound filled the air, and it made my eardrums rattle. Can you walk? Janine asked Marconi. The sheriff took a few shaky steps and nodded. Supporting one another, the two of them moved towards the footbridge as quickly as they dared. Rocks continued to fall all around them, pebbles mostly, although there was some large chunks in there, and one glance across the skull would cut our journey short in a second. We need to go, Mark, the inspector said in his warning voice. There was no time to search for my gun, so I hurried after the couple, arms shielding against the plummeting debris. The bridge groaned and creaked under us. It was almost as if the wood was decaying before our eyes, but we made it across in one piece. And together we lunged for the next exit. The portal slurped around us and stretched us like an agonizing rubber band before snapping us back and dumping us in an apocalyptic wasteland. Ten feet away, Janine's flare sputtered and went out. I see the next one, she shouted. A hot wind had picked up and bellowed in our ears. The tremors of the cave had followed us here and cracks were zigzagging across the dried soil. Janine held on to Marconi as we staggered through the wasteland towards the source of sparkling light. Portal after portal, we emerged in worlds that were falling apart. The upside down universe had been knocked askew, so we had to cling to the ground or fall sideways into space. The rickety old house had developed a sinkhole on the floor. We had to creep around. The ribcage of the massive creature had splintered. Our way forward was almost buried under piles of jutting bone. In that case, and in a couple of others, the inspector had to lift the debris out of our way so we could climb through and move on. The desert world had split into several distinct chunks, and I was worried that Marconi wouldn't be able to cross it in her condition, but she clung to Janine's hand and leapt over gap after gap. The inspector and I trailed after them, until at last we reached the window out and stumbled back in the Catamount State Forest. 
The inspector turned back to do something to the portal. It was a loud, wrenching sound, like someone tearing a branch off a tree, and when I glanced back behind me, I didn't see anything except a misty forest. The pocket universe was gone. I was beyond fatigued. I'm sure the others were too, but we didn't stop to rest, and it wouldn't do to get too complacent. We were following the trail as fast as Marconi could manage, clambering over fallen trees and squelching through the mud. We didn't stop until we reached the empty clearing where the poor lost campers had set up their fire pit. Janine and Marconi took a seat at the picnic table. But the inspector stood off at the edge of the clearing, staring into the forest. I went over to join him. Now, you haven't been you lately, I said. Ever since we started this case, you look tired. Your skin looks sick. Hell, even your cigar looks different. Hey, what happened to you? The inspector's lips tightened around the aforementioned cigar. He let out a heavy breath, but only a few wisps of steam curled around the tip, and they were gone in no time. He sighed, took the cigar out of his mouth, and tapped some ash onto the leaves. I don't belong here. I never did. Sometimes I forget that. Being in your world, helping you fight these entities, it gives me purpose. But it drains me. I can only stay here for so long, only exert so much of my energy before I need to return home. To recharge, if you will. Is that why you went in the cave? I asked. After the Wendigo attacked you? I remember the way his body had slumped against the stone. How his whole form looked hollowed out. It's like the lights went on in your eyes. I retreated, yes. The inspector reached up and adjusted his fedora. For a minute or so. I didn't want to leave you, but the giant had wounded me badly, and survival is an instinct we all share. I thought a quick dip behind the rift would give me enough strength to fight the creature again, but when I returned, Sheriff Marconi had this situation under control. He twirled a small object between his fingers. I saw nothing. Thin gray capsule, bulbed ends, and a thick crack running through the middle. Across the center, a peeled label in faded red letters read, Capra. What's that? The inspector glanced at me, then pocketed the capsule. Something I need to look into further. But nothing you need to concern yourself with. Not yet. He let out another reedy wisp of smoke and said, Perhaps you should check on Sheriff Marconi. I could take a hint. Leaving the inspector to his arcane, eldritch thoughts, I walked over to Janine and Marconi at the picnic table. The sheriff seemed to have regained some strength. The hand clutching Janine was firm and pink. There was a rosy glow on her cheeks that had been absent in the Wendigo's cave. The two women looked up at me when I approached. Hey, you never answered my question back there, I said. How'd you beat that thing? Marconi turned to look at Janine. Her hand clenched, and I saw Janine return the gesture. That same squeeze of closeness. This time, with a hand to grip back. Janine told me it fed on fear. So, I gave it the opposite. Ah, of course. I took a seat next to the two women and stared into the forest. The mist was starting to clear. Even as the sun was darkening and the tree branches stretched out in front of us, seemingly to float into a dusty cloud. A mountain lion yowled somewhere in the distance. Fireflies drifted through the twilight. The forest was alive. We were alive. And even though we hadn't been able to save everybody today, it felt good. You realize I'm in this now, right, Hannigan? Marconi said. 100%. Anything else comes after the people I love in this town, I want to help. And I want to know everything that's going on with you and that tall drink of water over there. I looked back at the inspector. In the darkening light, he looked more like a statue than ever. The tip of his cigar could have been one of the floating fireflies. I thought of him tearing that cigar from his mouth and igniting the old radio tower. I thought of him wrestling with a time eater at the lip of Skokomish Bluffs. He was a dynamo, source of incredible power. The inspector and I. But I wonder if I would ever really know the guy. 
You got a couple hours? I said. This could take a while. As the forest turned to night around us, I told them everything. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I don't think I've done one of these outros myself. Uh, it's only been RoboMCP, the same one that runs that 24-hour live stream that you guys are able to watch uh, 24 hours. But I wanted to say thank you for watching tonight's video, or listening, if you're listening over the podcast. And I especially wanted to give a very special thank you to Eric Mary, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Twinkie, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Van Tyne Jensen, Nicholas Said Eliasson, Glenda L. Hernandez, Terry Ramberg, Jazzy G. Asia, Mercer Virus 2, Sandy Barney, Chempinski, Dante Rao, The Ginger Bros, and Andrew Stenberg. You guys are the patrons that help keep the lights on in my place. And if anyone here would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta because, you know, anytime you guys do that, it helps me not die of starvation in my own home. I also wanted to give a quick shout out because I'd like to support every author I can find online. Michael Wellen, you can find at Twitter at author underscore Wellen, has a new book out called Within the Walls. It's available now on Amazon. I'll have a link right here on the screen and I'll throw it down there in the description down below. As always, you can find me on Instagram, Billy the Skeleton. You can find me on Twitter, where I am most of the time, at Mr. Creepypasta Zero. And you can find me at Spotify, uh, iTunes, Google Play, and just about everywhere else that you can think of to find a podcast. Oh, and YouTube, which is, yeah, the YouTube 24 hour live stream. Yet again, another time needing to mention it. Please go listen to the live stream. All right, guys. Sorry for taking up so much of your time at the end of the video. And sweet dreams.